Hi, this is Mark Linton Meyer talking with Fritjof Bergman. Uh, more about new work. We had an introductory video posted a little while ago. You might want to check out that first for an overview. Today we're going to focus on uh, community production or high tech self providing. So, very briefly, the, the place of that in the theory, the overall framework, the idea is to, well, in the case of employed people, to free up some of your time by providing. Uh, for some of your needs, being able to produce some of your own goods, and otherwise you'd have to be working at a regular job to earn that money uh, to then go buy the stuff at a store. So the idea is, there's, it's supposed to be time economical if we if it's implemented correctly. That at least some of your goods, your your regular, uh, you know, whether it be uh, household items or electronics or whatever or food. Uh, that at least some of that stuff could be produced in other ways that are not just going to buy it at a store and that this would actually be time effective and cost effective. Um, for folks that are uh, unemployed, and this is where Fritjof has been involved in projects in actually implementing this, they have a lot more time on their hands. They don't have to do that economic calculation of is what I'm producing here actually uh, sort of creating more value per minute than I would be at my job, uh, making the equivalent money to go spend. Um, but that's the uh, that's the place in the framework, and let's let's talk to to Fritjof. So so Fritjof, what uh can you g give me your overview of this before we jump into some of the individual implementations and individual products that are being produced right now? I would very much like to say as a very first sentence that I really would want to put the emphasis on questions, discussion, uh, very possibly also questions that are critical questions. And I think we need that. So I will try today to talk in ways that invite this kind of discussion. And let me maybe first say that it's useful to ask the question, well, what is the dynamic of the system in which we presently live. Where is this system going? Where is this system going if we simply allow it to continue? Or what seems to be necessary if we speed it up more and more in order to alleviate the problems that arise within it? And I think it's very obvious that uh, we now are uh, speeding up the economy in every possible way, and the most obvious you know, ways are, of course, how e even in the United States, the government uh, and the Reserve Bank does all, all manner of things in order to speed up the economy. Um, so the dynamic is that we are trying to speed up and I want to raise the question, well, how effective is this? Or can that solve the problems that present themselves? Uh, I think what I would want to argue is that even in the United States, uh, even in any number of areas in the United States, not just Detroit, but many areas, the, uh, the need... Uh, to provide people not just to somehow with jobs, the typical McDonald's jobs, but jobs that are what people call sometimes good jobs, well-paying jobs, jobs that make a life possible, you know, with sort of the image in the back, you know, that a day's work is, should be paid so that one can live off of it. That is becoming less and less possible. That is that the number of people, I'm speaking mathematically as it were, the number of people that are in some situation where they would need more of what jobs offer, where jobs would be more available to them, or the jobs would pay better, or the jobs would not only be part-time jobs, but be full-time jobs. All of that, all of that has, be, has reached a point where it's, here's the main point, where in terms of the numbers of people that are now at stake, this simply cannot be done. That is, we cannot uh, speed up the economy so that 
both, and I mean both at this point, and it should be discussed, but to my mind, both. We're on the one side, not in the United States, even in the United States, very often called the wealthiest country on the planet, it, um, so that we cannot achieve some kind of new stable wealth in the United States, not to speak of other countries like India and China and Russia and South America. So uh, we cannot simply move in the direction of still more production, of still using up, and I'm alluding to the ecological uh, issue of still using up more materials, uh, this will not solve the problem that we have and it will in fact become more and more insane or more, or more grotesque if you think in terms of, of India or of Russia. Uh, it, it, what would happen, and I'm asking you to ask yourself a, possibly a new kind of question. I mean, the question is, what is the dynamic of the system in which we at the moment live? What would happen if we allow this dynamic to continue on and on, or if we speed up this dynamic as is necessary? And the point is not only that even if we speed up, we cannot speed it up enough to really solve the problem of work for a vast number of people. I work, as has been mentioned in Detroit, even the idea you know, to, to somehow speed up whatever we are in, doing in Detroit to a point where everybody in Detroit would again have a good job. No one thinks that anymore. If, if, if that sort of perspective comes up in a conversation, people roll their eyes, eyes and, and, and think that the person has just somehow slept for a very long time. So uh, all of that, to my mind, leads to the simple conclusion that we do need an alternative. That is, if we simply go on with what we have, uh, we will produce ever more materials, we'll, we will speed up the economy ever more, but it will not be speeded up enough so that we really have a workable system. It will be more and more lopsided as we continue. So, uh, and it will be lopsided in terms of the materials, in terms of what is produced, in terms of whether what is produced can still be purchased, and on and on and on, including will it employ enough people at work that really needs to be done? Because more and more work is, of course, automated, as we all know, and more and more work is globalized. Given all of that, given that dynamic, can we simply go on? The answer to my mind is no. If we think about it, if we allow ourselves to think about it, we all know that that's grotesque, it's impossible, it's ludicrous. We need something dramatically different and when I say dramatically different, I mean we don't just need something where we have adjusted this little wheel or turned that little uh, gizmo. Uh, given uh, the perspective I have now tried to articulate, namely given the perspective of the current dynamic, we need something radically different, fundamentally different, different fr from the ground up, so to say. And there is, of course, the question, how and what would it look like and how is it possible? Now, uh, uh, maybe because this time I very much want to lead into discussion and I want to make a real effort to make what new work is trying to develop as, as plausible, uh, as graspable, as understandable as I can manage. Let me distinguish two different groups. New work works with two groups. One group is the, the very large number of people who, not simply unemployed, but who certainly are uh, with one foot in difficulty as far as their job is concerned. That's one group. But there is the other group, and it's important, I think, not only to see one, but both. That is, 
there is the group, the group I just mentioned, uh, people who are underemployed, who are poor, who are, are unemployed, who whatever, but also the people who are in what is sometimes called the fast lane, people who are successful, people who are in, in fancy jobs, in fancy corporations, something that very many people don't realize, not really enough, not nearly enough, is to what large extent these people are dissatisfied with the life and the, the, the work they do. That is, I happen because of what I do, I have a great, great deal to do with people who are very gifted and very talented and very innovative and who have all of those qualities that very often are enumerated. But they are rebellious because they feel, no, in if they work, whatever the com corporations, and I do mean including Google and, and Apple and, and the nicest and fanciest corporations, no, they complain because very often, the really creative part is not allowed time and space for. They're put under pressure. Very often, they get something done. Seven-eighths of it they get done, but then the pressure is on and they need to be do, doing something else. Or the pressure is on even before and they have the feeling they cannot really do the work they want to do. They cannot do it in the way in which they want to do it. But on the contrary, they work, even though they work for one of the fanciest computer corporations around, they always do their work under pressure. And this is something that they rebel against. They don't want to work like that. They want to, to have the time. And very often the way they put it is they want the time to be creative. They cannot be creative if they constantly have somebody standing over them and pushing them. So. I'm saying there are really two groups that new work addresses. There is the group that, just to use that term as an abbreviation, that are dramatically underemployed, not unemployed, but underemployed. And there is the very large group that are very well employed, but that despite that are not at all satisfied with the nature of, with the conditions, which with the time, with the pressure, with the circumstances under which even though they are very successful and among the very best and best paid, uh, they're not satisfied with that. And so we need to start from the idea that, look, uh, it's not as if there are only a very few people here and there who, uh, for God knows what, may be very antiquated reasons that have to do with Marx or whatever, uh, are not satisfied with the current system. That's, that's utterly absurd. I mean, please, please forget that. That is the past in the worst kind of way. That on the contrary, we now are way, way far away from that. But in this new dispensation, in this new arrangement, the number of people who are not satisfied with it, who are either underemployed or you could call it overemployed, overworked, uh, is, is very, very large. And that needs to be understood if one wants to understand new work at all. That is, we address people who, who don't sh look at us very surprised when we say, well, something different needs to be done. Actually, they don't have any patience with people who don't have something very different to offer. The fact that we do have something very different to offer is exactly what makes us attractive to them, what makes them curious about us, what makes them interested in us. And maybe let me especially emphasize this, the fact that what we are doing is drastically different is one dimension of it. The other dimension is that ever so many people at this point and, you know, live with the feeling, oh, well, yes, it's, it's a pretty lousy, you know, the, the whole arrangement is lousy and it's getting worse by the week. They feel, but there is absolutely no alternative. So what's the sense of it? So, yes, it's okay. Now, the thing is that a, a point about new work that we should discuss 
And I'm perfectly happy to, to make a, take a break and discuss it right now with Mark, is that for most people, there is only one alternative that is at all visible. That is, if we want to talk about new work, put into the picture that new work is perhaps the one really developed, in detail developed, historically developed, in many situations developed, in many projects developed, alternative. So there is an alternative. And it is one that has a lot for it, although, of course, there are many problems still around it. But for many people, this is the one alternative that they come across and they say, aha, aha, let's have a look at this. And that is the basis of the whole discussion. So to turn that discussion then, that, that was a good introduction. In fact, that reiterates a lot of the points. Folks, if they want to hear more about this sort of the, the paradigm shift and the people's sense of helplessness uh, and wanting to, uh, you know, feeling like there is no alternative, um, the, the beginning of your book, New Work, New Culture, which has not been printed in full in English yet, but the beginning of it is available on your website. So we'll link to that uh, if people want to look at that. Um, but there was a lot of impatience among the commenters uh, in response to our last video for for the details, the, the nitty gritty, how is this actually supposed to work? How is this actually supposed to save anybody money? How is this supposed to actually save anybody time? And I took the, your, your uh, description of the two different audiences there to, to say that how this community production, this high-tech self-providing, would work with these two different audiences is, is actually quite different now, that you'd be setting up different kinds of projects, different kinds of uh, sharing community arrangements uh, between the two of them. Um, and the, and as, as I said at the beginning, the, the one that you've been most active in actually doing this with has been for the, the first group, the, the down and out, the unemployed, the underemployed, the unemployable. You know, that's an important group, the folks that, you know, just getting them to, to excited about doing anything, even if it's not, uh, uh, you know, fulfilling their material needs entirely, uh, you know, just getting them the act of doing it can be revitalizing for them. But for the most part, it's supposed to be an economic thing, right? It's supposed to actually provide an alternative to getting goods to these, you know, whole, whole, you know, a tribe in uh, our small community in, in India or South America or Africa where the economy is otherwise devastated. There aren't a lot of jobs. Detroit being a local variant of that. Let me pick this up exactly as you put it. Let me try to be as vivid and as picturesque and as concrete as I can possibly be. Now, if I enter a situation, whether this now is a village in India or in Africa or a part of the city of Detroit, the thing I try to do at the beginning, step one, so to say, is I run through a very large number of possibilities, possibilities is a key word. There are possibilities. Not nothing is out there. Not everything is closed. Not all the doors are shut. But there are many, many different kinds of possibilities. And I very often spend three, four, five evenings just enumerating and painting. Painting is a good word. They're painting vividly for these kinds of people. Uh, the possibilities that they have. Maybe let me mention real quick that from the very beginning, even in Flint, one of the rooms in the Center for New Work in Flint was called the Room of Possibilities. So the idea of inspiring people, exciting people, encouraging people, enlivening people with a sense of, oh, oh my God, there are possibilities all around me. I have a choice among them. It creates a very different atmosphere from the atmosphere in which most of these people feel themselves to be imprisoned. Imprisoned is what I said. And there it is helpful if one knows something about how the whole machinery of getting people employment and you know, all of the different bureaucrat bureaucracies where they get a little piece of paper and then they are sent out to this and that and they stand in line and then they are told that there's a job over there and they should look for that. The atmosphere is so entirely different. It's not discouraged, not depressed, but on the contrary. The first step, 
And I use that word, and it sometimes offends people, is to create a sense of cheerfulness, to, to, to make it so that, by the way, I think philosophers have terribly underestimated the virtue of cheerfulness, uh, that we create a sense of cheerfulness. Now, let me spell that out. If you are, uh, call it down and out, or call it unemployed, or in any case, if you are among the people who are badly off, if somebody comes to you and says, look, the very, <laughs> me, the most obvious thing that is possible is for you to grow your own food. Now, what needs to be said is, I'm not assuming for one moment that everybody will want to grow their own food. No, no, no. But people who are hungry and who don't have a job and who have been trying to find a job and who have stood in line again and again and again and they didn't materialize and who were sent from Peter to Paul and nothing happened, for them to, to, to say to them, oh, wait, wait, wait. And now comes a crucial point. There are new ways of growing food. We are not talking about going back to the way your grandfather grew food or the way people were peasants in the last 50 or 100 years. No, nothing like that. So very early on in these evenings where I describe possibilities, one thing that comes up are vertical gardens which are a sort of a picture postcard piece of new work. That is, they are containers, and in these containers we have very, the, the richest possible soil, and the containers have holes all around them, and out of the containers grow, on, out of every hole grow something, whether it's a tomato or a cucumber or a melon, and to show them pictures, pictures, pictures is what this is all about of that uh, makes sort of, aha, it creates a different spirit, it creates a different atmosphere. Now, I want to insist and make very clear, especially to people who, whose foreheads are already wrinkled or whose brows look threatening, um, no, 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 we are not just talking about food by any means. Food is just a way of getting the conversation going. Actually, we try from the very beginning, and I do that whether I'm in Africa or India or Russia or Detroit, or for that matter, any other American city. It can be Cincinnati. Or, uh, I try to show things that can be done uh, by these people, that is, by the people who are the down and out or the discouraged or the disheartened. And that goes quickly, in relatively quick steps, up, up, up to ever more demanding and ever more impressive items. So it's not only food. In fact, I'm sort of sometimes mimicked and people make fun because I keep saying, you "No, know, what comes after vegetables? We, we can create vegetables, fine and good, but what comes after vegetables? And a first step after vegetables is very often electricity. Now, that raises the level of conversation because electricity for people, the kind of people we are now talking about, is a, a, a great threatening uh, calamity sometimes. That is, winter is just now beginning and electricity, if it's not paid for, gets turned off. And people literally, and I'm not exaggerating, and this is not melodramatic, if they don't have electricity, they freeze, and they sometimes freeze to death from not having, and, and in any case, it is to, the, to them dramatic that they can't pay the electricity. They know what that will mean, what that will mean in terms of their life, hot water, shower, all of that, cooking. So the idea of, no, 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 not just, not just tomatoes, but we can also create electricity and here are, and that's important, no, we are not talking about solar panels only. Solar panels are getting better and cheaper and more efficient and God knows what. 
But the whole, the main point from the perspective of new work, the main point is that there are a zillion ways of creating electricity. One that we exhibited in Austria when we had a new work exhibit a couple of years ago was especially charming and got a tremendous amount of discussion because it was simply a large piece of wood. It was a piece of a, a tree, a tree trunk, a piece of a trunk. And one had a, a built into that tree trunk propellers, just like at the end of a motor boat or something. And these propellers were turned by, this was on the Danube, in Linz, the, we, we, these tree trunks were tossed into the Danube, the Danube turned the, 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 the propellers, and the propellers turned a generator. And so just with a piece of wood and propellers, that was the demonstration we showed to people. That is something you can do. That is something anybody can do, and you can create your own electricity. Now, I again don't want to go on and on and on. I'll mention now in a swoop a whole lot of other things with the idea that then I'll take a break and maybe we can discuss. That is, this, please, please, this is only the barest beginning that what goes beyond that are new materials in almost everything. One new material that gets a special amount of, amount of discussion are new ways of creating bricks, eco-bond bricks, bio-bricks, biomason bricks. That is the possibility of not having to buy cement, which is expensive, uh, but on the contrary, making your own bricks no, they're the idea of you do it, you do it for yourself, you can do it, you're independent, you can make your own bricks. Again, that is only the barest beginning. But when I do these introductory talks in um, some corner of Detroit or in some corner of India or Africa or Russia, I bring in, startling as it may be, I bring in the very first two or three times already advanced machines, machines with which it is possible at this point for people who are down and out to make their own stoves, their own washing machines, their own furniture, their own tables. Beyond electricity, the furnishings of a house to a large extent can now be made. Beyond that, uh, going, you know, in the discussion, a very large item is what can be done with what people call fabricators or with three-dimensional printing. I bring in three-dimensional printing into the slums, so to say, and show, okay, look, that is now something around and it has become much less expensive. And with that, given the right training and given the right support and given the right context, which is created by new work, uh, the possibility of even m making for yourself things like your own phone or things like your own computer set up, not completely, not fully yet, but still to work in that direction gives you an idea of what has become a possibility. And there we are back with the word possibilities to show to people lots and lots of possibilities. So the ultimate goal, right, is for one of these communities, I believe you used the figure, to, to let them build about 80% of what they need themselves, right? Yeah, uh, and I'm glad you bring this in now, because to understand new work and especially community production, please think in terms of the future. That is, we are aware of where we are and what's possible and what's not possible. At the same time, we are creating a sense of purpose, which is what gives people courage and what gives people meaning to their life. We are saying this is a, a goal that we can work towards. And for most people, that is having a goal is almost the most important thing. Ever so many people live drearily without any sense of purpose or any sense of goal. And so the idea of, wait a minute, of course, 
here are any number of ways in which we can start. We can do this and this and this and this, and that's already possible. But we admit that's not 80% and it's not yet where we want to be. But you can see that in the next five years, maybe it will be seven or eight years, we can get to the point where, yes, virtually everything that one needs for a cheerful Mozart music-like life can be made by the people themselves in even a slum. Right. So the idea is not to compromise and say, you know, you can have the bare minimum that will be manufactured, but it's also to acknowledge the fact that we've got an over-consumptive, uh, you know, over-shopping society right now. So it's not that every single thing that you have right now would have sort of a new work manufactured uh, exact equivalent. It would be you know, these have to be things that people could, with supervision, with training, uh, have a hand in creating themselves. So they would be, you know, simpler, just more, more feature light. What, are, what is it, you know, that, so that's the engineering challenge. One of the things that you've been facilitating is uh, try to foster these inventions that are reproducible, that can be made in this, in this sort of format. So, you know, if you had a new work vacuum cleaner, it wouldn't be look exactly like your your Hoover with all of its various functions, but it would be something that would, would work. And, you know, since it's made in this community production environment, when it breaks, if you need a new part, you can make a new part so you can really make these things last a long time. Uh, so it's not, we're not saying this, this is going to be direct competition to the kind of stuff that's in the store. If you're, if you're well-to-do, you know, you're still going to find it probably more cost-effective to just go buy the vacuum cleaner rather than I mean, right now, this was an example that I tossed out to a, a, a maker group here in, in Madison. And they, they uh, said, you know, that would, oh, yeah, you're welcome to come down and we'll help you put in the, uh, the uh, 90 hours it would take to make your own vacuum cleaner. But it's not going to be anywhere near as good as something you could just buy, uh, you know, for the equivalent of, of four hours of your, of your job work. That, that, that when I pitched this as, as a, not as a homeless person, but as a person with a job, as can this sort of community production in a setup like they have, um, which is a uh, cooperative maker space. This is exactly the kind of thing that you're talking about with new work, where people pay a certain amount per month to sort of be members of this and use all their equipment. So they've got 3D printers, they've got uh, a lot of other manufacturing stuff, and more more importantly, they have uh, you know interested hobbyists and people like that on site that are you know, we'll help you out, we'll help you figure out how to use this stuff, we'll provide training, all that stuff would be necessary in a new work environment. And yet these folks thought when I brought this idea of, uh, you know, a new work vacuum cleaner to them, thought it was just preposterous. There's no way that's going to be cost effective. Uh, so speak to that a little bit. The, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Let me try uh, to respond to that. Uh, and it, it fits perfectly because I was just saying, uh, Look, we must think in terms of future development, the possibility of development beyond the point where we now are. Where we now are is very far from where we want to be. And to us, the most important thing is actually to have a sense of purpose, to have a sense of goal, to give to our society and culture a sense of direction which it now completely lacks. And so, I would not be appalled if somebody made fun of the idea of uh, right now making a vacuum cleaner. But I would jump right in and say, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I am impressed with makerspaces. I've worked in makerspaces. I approve of makerspaces. I can say all kinds of other nice things about makerspaces. But they're not, not what new work is ultimately aiming for. That is... Uh, the kinds of tools, the kinds of materials that, that we uh, use or want to use are much more advanced than those in maker spaces. And so we're not talking about 90 hours uh, it's as opposed to four hours or something like this. Um, if you bring in tools like 3D printing, you can already move uh, much faster and here's a next thought, and, and please sort of take seriously the idea that we need to think, to think together about this, 
to, to create the, 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 the idea of a possible different direction in which our culture and society and especially our economy could develop. Here's the point. We are very careful in our selection. We wouldn't ever dream of going into some situation and saying, okay, so everything, so let's start from vacuum cleaners. Not at all. I mean, we have a sense of what can be done right now and what cannot be done. And probably making vacuum cleaners is as far from possible as you could fear. We pick very carefully the sort of things that indeed can be what we call community produced. A good example of that is, of course, the example of bricks, but plenty of other examples where it is, uh, no, it has become very possible uh, to make things uh, that make a life possible that are nothing like as complicated as, as a vacuum cleaner. So I would say part of the process of development, part of the process of thinking, part of the development of community production is to pick very carefully those things which people with tools and with mentoring and with advice and with help and with materials and very often with best possible machines actually can be made relatively quickly and relatively easily. And not and that picks up on something you just said. I mean, the last thing we imagine is to sort of do everything again, what, every, what already exists in shops. The idea is to, to go through and to look at different things and say, well, now, isn't this something that could be done rather differently? And now let me throw in an example which has already been mentioned, but which will make this much more convincing. That is, in Austria, we deliberately, out of the kind of uh, dilemma thinking, difficult thinking, oh, is it workable or is it not workable? How far is it workable? Out of that kind of thinking, we decided to try to work on an electric motorcycle. And the idea was that is something very desirable, uh, not necessarily everywhere, but yes, there are a great number of different countries in which uh, the need for some means of transportation with which one can transport, if it's necessary, vegetables, if it's necessary, a sick person, if it's necessary, whatever. Uh, but need for transportation is enormous. And let me just quickly mention that it's a fact that possibly up to 40% of all the vegetables that are produced in India do not make it to the market but rot simply because they don't have the means of transportation that would bring the vegetables, which they actually have, to market. So transportation in that case makes the difference between humongous waste and a much more sensible way of using what, in fact, they are producing already. So against this backdrop, we did not simply create a motorcycle that was like motorcycles had always been. It was from the beginning utterly different and the conception of it, the way it was designed, the way it was planned, the way it was sold, the way it was marketed, all of that was different from what is normal. And so it was a, a deliberate attempt to introduce an example of what, how this would be in a new world culture. Specifically, we insisted that this should be a motorcycle that people could assemble themselves. Assembling is actually something that in the whole auto industry contributes a great, great deal to the cost. And if one can assemble things, yeah, there's the point that you just mentioned. If one can design a motorcycle from the beginning so that it is much, much easier to assemble. And I remember right now, and one of the things that played a role in the marketing of the electric motorcycle that we manufactured in a new work fashion in Austria was the number nine. Well, we insisted that 
there are only nine real pins or nine screws that are necessary to hold this motorcycle together. If you take all nine of them out, you have all the, all of the pieces are already as pieces, which led to the idea that this motorcycle can be bought, assembled, and then it's much more expensive, not hugely more expensive, but significantly more. But you can also purchase just the parts and with a manual and possibly with an assistant or a mentor who helps you to put it together. We linked that up with schools in Steyr, where in the schools, people learned how to put together their own motorcycle. And the idea of a motorcycle that can come to you, as it were, in a box, and that was something that we used for the marketing, a motorcycle in a box, uh, that, that gives you an idea of the direction in which new work is going. That is... And coming back to the, the notorious vacuum cleaner, uh, we, were, we had done a great deal of homework and we were very sure that a motorcycle maybe could really be manufactured so that it could be assembled with nine pins so that it really the parts could be so that one could put together, that one could put them together in a very simple way that makes it possible for almost anybody to put it together. That was, you know, it was possible in the case of motorcycles. I'm saying it is very possibly not possible in the case of vacuum cleaners. So we don't simply reproduce everything, but we pick out those things that can be community produced or high-tech self-providing produced as opposed to mass manufactured. Well, and I assume the idea is then to get something that would take maximum advantage of the cost savings there, that if you think motorcycles in particular are marked up tremendously when they're made by professional dealers and sold to you, whereas consumer electronics maybe aren't so much, then, you know, you would want to focus on the, was that kind of consideration at play? No, absolutely. And that's a wonderful contribution to the conversation that uh, we it, you know, a great, great deal of this goes into planning and thinking. And you're right, you know, the markup in the case of motorcycles is enormous. Uh, it's roughly 80% of the value. Uh, that's not the case with any number of other things. So that was one of the reasons why we said, okay, let's as a beginning, as a start, as an example, as a demonstration, let's work on a new work motorcycle. That actually was very successful. All of the magazines were describing it as a breakthrough, as a world-orienting first, and we are now talking about um, developing it beyond Austria in other countries, especially possibly in the Middle East where transportation would make a huge difference to the kind of warlike atmosphere that in all Middle Eastern countries is getting ever more accentuated. So uh, what has, you know, this is a main, main point that must not be lost sight of at, for, for, for a moment. Now, what is practicable? What in fact practically can be done in terms of a community production or with the constraints of community to construct uh, production. And a motorcycle is something. Other people are working on other things. So no one here have we talked about uh, costs in terms of, you know, it, it, you could say, well, couldn't we solve this problem of uh, people not having their materials and needs met, at least in countries like the U.S., by just uh, you know, taxing the rich and having a, a a guaranteed minimum income or something like that. And, uh, you know, besides that, that's just politically difficult to pull off. And we've talked about in other settings, the fact that that's not enough, that then people would just become alcoholics and you would, you'd need to give them counseling to figure out how to do work that is, how to, how to fill that time with something that is productive and meaningful to them and, and uh, gives them a sense of purpose. Putting all that aside, uh, there's still a question if you're if you're saying instead of that instead of just pushing for a heavy-handed uh, government support for the poor 
Uh, and then yes, we can provide you know some counseling and thing and education for them so that they'd uh, you know not just waste their lives away uh, given that their basic material needs have been met. If you're saying that this the process of community production, um, you know, f for someone who's down and out, that in itself can be a can be a calling, can be something that is uh, energizing to them. Um, all right. G given that, you know, so so somebody that, that feels very helpless, doesn't feel that they, they can do anything to support themselves, saying you can make your own vegetables. Maybe you can make your own motorcycle. This can be tremendously exciting to them. Uh, but there's still the question of, okay, there's still costs involved in setting this stuff up, in setting up the vertical gardens, in giving you the, the super high-tech, better-than-any-maker-space uh, tools uh, that you need to produce these items. So where does this money come from? Absolutely central question. And I like to say in all of the projects in which I'm involved in that it, you can't do anything without money. So I emphasize very much in these conversations the need for money. And one answer may be upsetting or whatever, but there's no sense in beating around the bush. The idea is the money may have to come from uh, foundations, from rich people, but also from government. That is, uh, in fact, maybe I can make that vivid. I worked for many years in Africa, and I, part of what I was working on is to work out in mathematical detail how much the government was spending on a, the creation of a job. What does it cost to create a job? It, it's very expensive if you start to seriously think about this. What is the investment necessary for one job? Now, we proposed to the government in many conversations and in many proposals and applications that the, the ratio, that, and we meant that with a little bit of tongue in cheek, but the ratio is roughly something like one to a thousand. That is, we said, give us what would be needed, for, give us a thousandth of what would be needed for a job. And with that money, we can possibly raise the life of a whole village. And sorry, just so you're saying the, the alternative is the way that they're trying to get jobs now is by uh, you know, currying favor with corporations to come and create jobs, right? That's the primary way. Or are you saying actually, you know, make work jobs? We're actually going to just, as a government, uh, hire a lot of people to fix fix the roads. Those seem to be the two ways that governments would be making jobs before your proposal comes here. Right, and and and, and the first of these is maybe the the one that really one should focus on. That is, that it's of course worldwide you know, that. Um, corporations don't pay taxes or corporations get all kinds of different allowances. In fact, let's call it by its name. They are bribed to produce in Illinois rather than in Michigan. And so we are saying, no, no, no. You don't have to spend very large amounts of money in order to attract jobs. The alternative, and that's really wonderful if we can formulate that and make people think like this. There is the alternative of buying jobs, paying huge amounts of money, reducing taxes, doing whatever can be done in order to attract people, you know, corporations or outfits or organizations that promise to produce jobs. By the way, it's a well-known fact that they promise a number of jobs which very often is, does not materialize. The money has been spent, but the number of jobs that are actually created is incomparably smaller to the promises that were originally made. Now, in that context, new work can say, look, for a fraction of the money that you spend in order to seduce one company to come to Michigan, for a fraction of that, Give us some, you know, give us one hundredth of what you would spend for the jobs you want to have in Dearborn. And f f with that fraction, we can improve and not just improve, but radically change the life of a very large number of people. So, of course, 
what plays a great role in, in the development and the organization and the moving forward of new work is the contrast to the alternative. Okay, so give us, you've, you've sketched a lot about the possibilities and the aspirations for doing this. G give me a little sketch of, you know, how this actually has played out somewhere. Well, uh, at the moment, our admittedly picture book example is the electric motorcycle. But not for a whole community, you know, you're saying we can, presumably if you're, you're, you're uh, taking a whole village in Africa, uh, and you're saying that we're going to take some of this money instead of using it for other kinds of job creation and we're going to revitalize, revitalize the economy that way, then that's not just getting everybody together to create one kind of product, right? That's, that's implementing a, a, a swath of things. Right? Just tell me a little more about how that looks or has that even been done? It is absolutely essential you know, that um, in the conception of new work that people will not just produce one item, but actually, and you've mentioned this before, and it keeps coming up, that ultimately what we are aiming at is something like producing 80% of everything that one needs for a pleasant, humane, cheerful life. The point about this is that if you approach that, and we are beginning to approach it, then the people are transformed by that because it is a totally different life if most of what you have in your living room or in your house is something that you have made. And the experience of you having made it makes all the difference. To sit on a table that you have made is a very different experience from sitting down on a table that you have just picked up at IKEA. And so uh, creating a culture in which people to uh, steadily, uh, but we are thinking in terms of long range and gradual process, progress, to create a culture in which the vast majority of people create the vast majority of things they need in workshops that are close to their home, in more advanced maker spaces than the maker spaces are now. But think of it sort of as how would a city look like? I mean, there would be many, many halls. There maybe would be 15, 20, 25 different halls, maybe a little bit like the famous Buckminster Fuller's domes, in which people would close to their home within walking distance from them, without having to commute, without transportation where they would have the possibility of creating and manufacturing a great, great deal of what they need. If somebody grows up, so to say, think of this also in terms of an extension of schools, if somebody, not just one product, but if the school from the beginning, from when you are six and seven years old, says, look, we are trying to prepare you for a life in which you will make your own chairs and you will make your own tableware and you will make your own windows and you will make your own phone and on and on and on. Now, the, the kind of intelligence that you would develop in people would be very different from the intelligence you have now. All right, so we're going to have to, I think, work toward wrapping this up, but let's let's try to maybe hit a few more points. Now, when I've, I've talked about community production, to people like this, and a, a lot of the, the reason for this, you're saying this is possible because because uh, manufacturing techniques have gotten more sophisticated. That you don't necessarily need a big factory with a bunch of different machines that each you know add one little part. You can have a single machine, you know, like the the, the Star Trek replicator is what's always sort of posited as the ultimate version, eventual version of this. Uh, and 3D printers right now fall very, very far short of that, and that's something that you readily admit. Uh, but still, the idea is that you could have, in a small space, as we were saying last time, a, a, uh, a machine that would be able to do a lot of things, that would be able to you know, not just add one little nut to something, but that would be able to do a lot of the different parts in construction of a given object and be uh, you know, programmable to deal with a lot of different objects. So that's that's what's 
appealing about 3D printing is that there's already even a, a big sub subculture. I think Thingiverse is a, is a website where you can get uh, the, the plans, the, the uh, computer-aided drafting plans that you're, you can load into your 3D printer. I've never actually done this, so I'm sure I'm not using the terminology exactly right. Uh, but that, you know, so there are a lot of objects that as long as you've got these basic materials and things, you can, you can do that all together. Um, so, you know, it, it, it sounds like that we've got a lot more manufacturing power potentially in community hands or even in the hands of individuals if you go buy a 3D printer for your house. However, I, I still encounter a lot of skepticism as to whether this is actually going to be cost effective uh, in any way. That, that these same advances, of course, are also open to the um, established manufacturing industry. So we've already seen a great drop in the prices of manufactured goods. And yes, some of that is a matter of cheap foreign labor and a lot of things that we want to avoid uh, ultimately in a society is causing greater injustice maybe than, than we would like. Uh, but still, you know, you could say, you know, this has already been accomplished and the answer is Walmart, that, that you could already go and pay just pennies for so much of this stuff so that already people can live and have been forced to live unfortunately, on a, on a, a pretty small income uh, and take advantage of all this, you know, a, apart from, of course, the, uh, the, as you were saying, the psychological benefits to, I made this table myself and this, you know, I feel a sense of accomplishment and I had this uh, hopelessness before and now I've been raised up because I can do some little bit. Um, there's still a lot of skepticism as to, certainly right now, I know you're saying in the future we can, we can I don't know, hope that the market's change so that this will be more cost effective I'm not sure what what the uh, solution is here but what you know what why would the movement be toward community production instead of just toward cheaper manufacturing cheaper goods uh, maybe the government even needs to take some action in terms of we, we discussed before uh, devaluing certain items this is in the in the days in the many years I thought about this since since learning the basics from you in college uh, you know, before anything like this community production was, was, was technologically possible, you know, with 3D printing and other things now, uh, I really thought of it more in terms of the government uh, deciding that, look, we're not going to tie uh, subsistence to having a job anymore. And so we are going to take at least a full time job. A jo uh, so we're going to take measures to make certain goods cheaper. And, you know, there's, that's what food subsidies are all about. Uh, the government already does this with water. Water could be, uh, you know, with fire departments for, you know, there's all these either things that are directly funded by the government or like the post office supported by the government. So basically they're fixing the market so that everybody will be able to afford a stamp to mail a letter, that kind of thing. Why, why not more of that instead of this community production? I will give you a very straight answer to that. And maybe we can do some of our next uh, broadcast or videotaping around that. What these people ignore that advocate the future of Walmart is quite simply what people want. What I think is needed at this point in the conversation we are having is to be confronted with people who say, I don't want to buy, I want to make, which goes into the whole concept of maker space. Uh, that, is, that is a fundamental fact that uh, p people ha have a, a powerful desire to be a different person. And I'm sorry, but I will rebel against the idea of saying, well, it's a psychological advantage that makes it sound like something that gets discussed on a couch. Uh, no, it's not that. It is life transforming. It is a, an entirely different life. And it is an entirely different life that many people at this point want. Uh, to some extent, even if it is not, to use the word you used a number of times, cost effective. That is, yes, okay, even if it requires quite a number of hours of work, and even if it requires st strain and stress and this and that, ultimately, people say, give it to me, let me do it, let me do it. I want to do something that has some meaning and some purpose and that gives me a sense of my own value and a sense of my pride and a sense of my own accomplishment and possibility. That is, 
ultimately it comes down to what people really, really want. And I think what people really, really want is not to become consumers who purchase forever smaller amounts of pennies, this, that, and the other thing. That is ultimately not attractive to people. Ultimately, what is attractive to people is to be able to make things. Well, and you say, and when you say people, you're really talking most about the populations you've been serving. So that it's it's these people again with, you know, that you work with Native American tribes, for instance, who you know maybe as in Canada, the government might even be providing for their basic material needs, but still they feel that there's just nothing that they can do, that all their customs, the things that they used to do for money have been taken from them, that big companies now do the things, you know, the logging or whatever that they were able to do, the hunting is no longer available. So this is this 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 feeling that is common in a lot of these impoverished areas of just utter uh, dep depression, not just in terms of being uh, poor materially, but just uh, it's, a, it's a spiritual ailment that there's they don't feel like there's anything they can do. So for these people, community production becomes the calling that we were talking about. Whereas for the most listeners of this, you know, community production could play an eventual role in your life to enable you to work less at your real job. But we, we had pretty carefully uh, distinguished in the first podcast, I think, between um, your regular job work time on the, on the one hand, which would be less, uh, your community production time, which I would think in sort of this, the, the, the first world would be a little more like uh, you know, like what you do with housework now. You spend a little time per day to do it. So maybe some of that time is using your 3D printer or whatever to, uh, you know, I need a new plunger. I need a, uh, I go out and tend to the vertical garden in the back or more likely go to a community center where you're participating in a cooperative effort to generate some of this stuff. There is a picture there's a, a, of, you know, folks right now that are pretty well off employing community production in their lives, but that's not that's probably not going to be their calling. Their calling is maybe something, as you were talking about with the programmers at Google, you know, they already maybe have something creative that they want to do. Um, so this is, you know, whereas for these uh, impoverished, more impoverished areas, not that this is ultimately going to be the only work that they do that is meaningful. Maybe they'll also be poets. They'll also be, uh, you know, do any number of service uh, jobs, other things that we would call a calling. But just the, the process of making things for themselves itself, at least as an initial step, serves the same psychological slash spiritual role of, of a calling. So that's, I, I know it's very uh, easy to just completely conflate the two when, uh, when we're talking about this, because you're talking specifically about these, these uh, projects you've been involved with. It is not true that this is only uh, applicable to people who uh, live in poverty or, uh, in any case, uh, have very straightened circumstances and basically have always gotten the short end of the stick. I think it is not true that it applies only to them. On the contrary, very much also the people who are the fortunate ones, who are in the fast lane, who do relatively well, they are dissatisfied with the work they do. They want to work in a different way. The degree to which they are dissatisfied is way underestimated. One needs to talk to these people. One needs to again and again and again have a conversation with somebody who says, I was doing very well. I had this and that and the other thing and I had three promotions to, to choose from, but I didn't want that. I wanted a different life. And new work offers a different life. 